Indiana News Desk is made possible in part by the following. Indiana University's Center for Applied Cybersecurity Research, presenting Security Matters with tips for improving online security in three minutes or less. Main Source Bank, headquartered in Greensburg, Indiana, offering products and services to fit every stage of life. More information at mainsourcebank.com. Main Source, life needs a great bank. Member FDIC and equal housing lender. Smithville Communications, serving Southern Indiana with high speed fiber gigabit internet. Smithville Fiber Gigabit Technology, tap the power. And by WTIU members, thank you. Coming up on Indiana News Desk. These kinds of things bring out the best in people. Hoosiers gather to pray as an Indiana family pleads with the Islamic State to release their son. We would ask that the captors show, show mercy and follow the true teachings of the Quran. Indiana is required to recognize the marriages of same-sex couples. Emotionally, feelings aren't changed because we really always were a family. But the discussion over gay rights is far from over. Will the legal fight continue? And does the Supreme Court's decision do much to change the mind of many Hoosiers? These stories, plus the latest news headlines from across the state. You don't get in and start messing with the arts. Right now on Indiana News Desk. Hello, I'm Joe Wren and welcome to Indiana News Desk. Same-sex marriage is legal in Indiana. In a surprise move this week, the U.S. Supreme Court declined to hear cases from several states, including Indiana, challenging same-sex marriage bans. That meant the ruling from the Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals striking down Indiana's marriage law was left intact and same-sex couples could start getting married. I think today's day just says yes. This is over. Hoosiers are equal across the board. But unlike the rush to the courthouse we saw in June, clerks' offices around the state were mostly quiet on Monday with only a few couples coming in to get marriage licenses. No marriages were being performed. In June, of course, we had three days of a very, very busy situation here because there was great demand and there was uncertainty. Because at that point, of course, Judge Young had ruled, which was the district court, but we, had, we were pending a decision uh, in the Seventh Circuit. And so there was going to be a stay issued, everyone believed, and so there was a sense of significant urgency. You know, come in, get your license, but also make sure you get your ceremony because uh, you don't want to be caught you know, in between the time of the stay. Well, there's no similar urgency right now. Instead, couples are waiting, planning out their marriage, making sure friends and family can attend. Caterers are booked and dresses and tuxedos are purchased. It's these normalcies that same-sex couples say they've been fighting for. But even though the legal issue appears to be settled, Hoosiers still hold very different opinions when it comes to same-sex marriage. And as Gretchen Frazee reports, how that's handled moving forward could have an impact on future generations. Stephen Stolen and Rob McPherson were preparing to celebrate their sixth wedding anniversary this weekend when they heard the news. Indiana would be required to recognize their marriage, which was already recognized in California. It's almost like we're getting married again and again today, and I guess maybe that's what that must be like, that, you know, it was like another wedding day for us, and that's pretty exciting. Stolen and McPherson were two of the plaintiffs in the case challenging Indiana's ban on same-sex marriage. They say one of the main reasons for joining the lawsuit was their daughter. We have a 16-year-old daughter who was born in Bloomington. Um, her name's Abby, and she's a junior at University High School. This week really isn't different than any other week for Abby. After coming home from school, she plays a couple songs on the guitar. Later this evening, she'll have dinner with her dads. Emotionally, Feelings aren't changed because we really always were a family. But she says she recognizes the Supreme Court's ruling has significantly changed things for other families who might not be seen as equals in their communities. I think in today's society, it's better to have a family that can honestly feel like a family and is recognized 
in the eyes of the government. The Supreme Court's decision does put same-sex couples on equal footing legally when it comes to marriage, but it hasn't necessarily changed the opinions of Americans or Hoosiers. Opponents of same-sex marriage like Ryan McCann say they stand by their beliefs and are worried about the consequences the court's decision could have on future generations. We appreciate that everyone can love children and um, there are so, so many great people that love kids in the state and we love that, but we also understand that all the love in the world can't make a mom a dad or a dad or mom. Same-sex marriage just became marriage. During a celebration for same-sex couples on Monday, Disciples of Christ minister Matthew Meyer Bolton emphasized the Supreme Court's decision provides an opportunity to talk about some of those opposing viewpoints. So many of these battles between adults, you know, what we're really battling about is, is our kids and what kind of world we want our kids to grow up in. So I think we should be very careful as we model uh, civil discourse between grown-ups uh, to model that for our kids because that's the world that we want them to grow up into too is a world where we can disagree in a way that doesn't demonize the other side or use religion as a weapon. McCann says that could be difficult because the legal battle likely isn't over. In other states where same-sex marriage is legal, couples, for example, are suing Christian business owners who do not believe they should provide services for same-sex weddings. I would love to see an environment where that didn't occur and people of um, different views could just agree to disagree. Um, I think on our side of the aisle we've tried to do that for 10 years now and unfortunately those who um, want to push the agenda that they have have continued to push to overturn our state laws and are now are, are pushing um, for folks, like I said, small businesses, a lot of different areas to accept their viewpoint or go to court. Legal experts say those kinds of court cases aren't likely to go far in Indiana though because there isn't a federal or state law prohibiting discrimination based on sexual orientation. And years from now, Stephen Stolen says he thinks those disagreements will largely be a thing of the past anyway. While there are other things in the political spectrum that we might agree or disagree about, this is a moment where we're all going to go, we will look back on this and say, people are married. And that's what, that's how, that's going to be the change. We're going to drop same sex and we're going to drop traditional and everybody's going to be married. And that'll be a very good thing. To talk more about the legal implications of the Supreme Court's decision, we're joined now by State House reporter Brandon Smith. Brandon, thank you for being here. As we mentioned, the Supreme Court essentially legalized same-sex marriage in several states by declining to hear those cases, but the Supreme Court can pick this up again, right? Though there are a number of cases in the federal court system dealing with bans on same-sex marriage. If a federal appeals court were to uphold a ban, it would essentially force the Supreme Court to take up the issue. But given that the court just allowed appeals court rulings that all struck down bans to stand without ruling, it seems likely the current court would side with gay marriage supporters. What does the ruling mean for other states that have cases that are moving through the court system? Well, some of the legal experts I've talked to this week say the Supreme Court was essentially sending a message when it declined to hear all of the same-sex marriage cases and that other appeals courts will take the hint, basically, and strike down any gay marriage bans. But that's not a guarantee, which definitely keeps the issue alive and leaves other states in limbo. And then we've talked about the debate over HJR3 many times before. That's the proposal that would have put the ban on same-sex marriage into the state constitution. Uh, what comes of that now? Well, House Speaker Brian Bosma was conspicuously silent on that issue this week. He was the only legislative leader, legislative leader who didn't send out a statement. Now, Senate President Pro Tem David Long did. He said he was disappointed the Supreme Court didn't uh, issue a more definitive ruling on same-sex marriage, but says that unless the court takes up the issue again in the future, HJR 3 is basically dead. Okay. Thank you very much, Brandon. Thank you, Joe. And now for headlines, we go over to Alex Dirkman, who has the latest on this week's top stories. Thank you, Joe. You might want to double check if you received an alert from Duke Energy saying your bill was past due. Duke Energy mistakenly sent overdue notices to 500,000 current and former customers in Indiana, Kentucky, and Ohio. Company officials say they're working to correct the error. If you aren't sure whether your bill is late, Duke officials say you should contact customer service. 
If you registered a vehicle with the BMV anytime since 2004, you might be receiving a tax refund. The Bureau of Motor Vehicles improperly calculated taxes on more than 5 million vehicles over the past decade. So this week, the BMV started mailing letters to Hoosiers who are eligible for refunds. If you receive a claim form, BMV officials say you need to fill it out and return it to the BMV. Claims then should be processed, processed within 30 days. Governor Mike Pence says there are still major disagreements he and federal officials need to work out before health care can be expanded in Indiana. The governor met with Health and Human Services Secretary Sylvia Burwell this week to discuss Indiana's HIP 2.0 petition. That plan would expand coverage to about 350,000 Hoosiers, but it does not meet all the federal requirements of traditional Medicaid expansion. For example, it requires some participants to pay into health, health savings accounts to receive coverage. This summer marked the start of the Columbus Area Art Council's 2014 Sculpture Biennial. Eight large modern pieces are displayed in public spaces around the city and county. But as Sarah Fenton reports, the sculptures are raising questions about the city's role in curating public art. Last summer, the biennial was going full steam ahead. Contracts with artists, property owners, and organizers were agreed upon, and everything seemed to be running smoothly. But then in July, the project hit an unexpected roadblock. Arts Council Executive Director Karen Schrode received an email from the Columbus City Attorney. It said Mayor Kristen Brown didn't like the original contracts regarding the three sculptures that were to sit on city property. They just want the ability to be able to remove the works in, in the event that there is a problem. Now we don't... Uh, you know, it's very open-ended as to what that would be. The original contract stated the sculptures would be placed for two years at an agreed-upon location. Brown, however, doesn't want to sign them until she gets permission to move the sculptures to another place without consulting the artist or the Arts Council. Mayor Brown herself has a front row seat to one of the sculptures. Decathexis, which has caused a mixed reaction among residents, is on display right outside City Hall. Councilman Frank Jerome says the city council has no say in the contracts, and he doesn't know why the mayor wants permission to move the pieces. While he agrees with the city's right to move the sculptures, he notes the city would foot the cost. They also have the expense because it's not simple. I don't know how you would move the one at City Hall because it's sunk in concrete. So you're going you're to have a big hole when you get rid of that, and then you can damage it moving it and everything. If the artist didn't agree to the new terms, he or she would have the option to ship their sculpture back. Artists paid to send their sculptures to the biennial under the impression they'll receive two years of exposure. If they have to pay to send them back early, it could mean they wasted thousands of dollars. You don't get in and start messing with the arts. David Cadillac curated the 2014 biennial. He says he's troubled by what he sees going on at City Hall. The city could say, we're going to move it out here in the alley next to the dumpsters. The artist then could say, I don't like that. The city could say, tough. Calls to the mayor's and the city attorney's office went unreturned. Organizers won't know the reasons why the mayor wants permission to move the sculptures until the contracts are rewritten. In the meantime, they're continuing their work on the biennial. One of the final sculptures is scheduled to be installed sometime this month. U.S. Customs and Border Protection officers at the Indianapolis International Airport say they seized 27 gallons of a date rape chemical called Gamma Beauty Relactone, or GBL. According to authorities, the amount seized was worth about $35,000. The shipments had misleading invoice descriptions to disguise the contents, and the majority of the shipments came from China. When consumed, GBL is converted by the body to GHB, making the person highly intoxicated. The Indiana Supreme Court says causes of death are now public record and must be available at the county level. The Evansville Courier and Press and, the Evansville, and an Evansville resident filed a lawsuit against the Vanderburg County Health Department after the department denied access to the records in 2012. The health department claimed state law required it to restrict access to the information, but a local judge ruled in favor of the agency and the state appeals court upheld his ruling. The Associated Press reports the Supreme Court acknowledged that public disclosure of the cause of death might be painful for relatives and friends of the deceased, but the court said the General Assembly had rejected numerous attempts to exempt death certificates from public records laws. 
Indiana ranks 36th in the country in a recent report assessing the well-being of girls. The CEO of the Girl Scouts of Central Indiana, Deborah Hearn Smith, says one of the most surprising statistics is that 40% of Indiana girls live in poverty. That means four out of six girls have issues around health care, have issues around eating, families have not had adequate food supplies, have issues around security and scarcity. Smith is traveling the state discussing the report. She's already visited Terre Haute, Indianapolis, and Richmond, and plans to visit Lafayette. As Blooming Foods workers take steps to unionize, member owners are also pushing for additional transparency in how the company operates. Casey Kuhn has more. After rallying outside of the food co-op just west of downtown Bloomington, employees, member owners, and state union representatives marched to the monthly Blooming Foods board meeting at their administrative offices to meet with the co-op board. At the meeting, Blooming Foods employee and member owner Lauren McAllister said the board needs to be more open to hearing and meeting the needs of the employees. In the meeting, it seems tense. It seems uncomfortable. It seems like people are holding back strong emotions and that we aren't coming to a common ground. Blooming Foods president Tim Clower says the meeting was an important chance to hear from the member owners, but the board doesn't have a stance on the unionization efforts of employees. The main emphasis tonight was in listening and being able to hear as many members of ours that wanted to speak and what they had to say and making sure that they knew that we were listening. The next well, step is for the Blooming Foods workers yeah. to turn yeah. in their union yeah. petition to the National Labor Relations Board for approval before taking a final vote on whether to unionize. Lawmakers say the General Assembly needs to weigh in on the issue of high fenced deer hunting preserves next session after years of stalled legislation. The existing preserves have been allowed to continue under a series of court orders, leaving operators in limbo, not sure whether to move forward or make investments. Republican Senator Michael Kreider, formerly a DNR conservation officer, says any bill legalizing the preserves faces an uphill battle because of concerns about disease among fenced deer and the cost associated with those risks. The legislature has never passed a bill dealing with the hunting preserves, despite several attempts. The Indiana parents of NBA basketball players Cody, Luke, and Tyler Zeller are writing a book full of lessons and stories about parenthood. The book begins with the relationship Steve Zeller had with his father and ends with the story of Steve's recent heart surgery and the strengthened bond it created between him and his son Luke. The Zellers plan to release the book in February and to offer pre-orders this December. And speaking of trying to bring about peace, an Indianapolis artist has created a peace sculpture out of weapons. An eight-foot-tall sculpture of a dove was unveiled this week at the Indianapolis Central Library. Police are legally required to dispose of guns they confiscate. So the Marion County Sheriff's Office asked fire, fire, firefighter Ryan Feeney to do something unique with the 750 pounds of firearms they had. The artist says he hopes the works remind people of the innocent people affected by gun violence. He hopes it shows Indianapolis residents are not apathetic about crime. And Joe, the sculpture will remain in the public library for about six months, and then local officials will decide on a more permanent location for it. That reminds me of that sculpture. Have you ever seen it on the side of the parking garage on North Walnut in Bloomington? Right. Yeah, the, the guitar, it's all made of recycled license plates and street signs. Awesome. <laughs> Thanks, Alex. Yes. Coming up next on Indiana News Desk. An Indianapolis native who was doing humanitarian work in the Middle East is taken hostage by ISIS. His parents are reaching out to his captors asking for his release. And hundreds of Hoosiers hold a prayer vigil in support. And a house gets moved straight off its foundation. The incredible images and why people are going to such lengths to save the house. These stories right here. We believe in the excitement of exploration. That life offers each of us adventures that are ours for the taking. We believe that children are born explorers who need trusted guides on their journeys of discovery. We believe in breaking new ground and in challenging assumptions that important questions deserve to be explored deeply, fairly, and honestly. And we believe that who you are and where you come from should never stand in the way of what you want to be.
This is who we are. This is what we believe. This is PBS. Welcome back to Indiana News Desk. I'm Joe Wren. For the second time in a week, Hoosiers are gathering in support of the Indianapolis native who is being held hostage by the group that calls itself the Islamic State. The family of 26-year-old Abdul Rahman Kasig is asking people to pray for a safe return. Kasig was captured a year ago. Now they're threatening to kill him. Barbara Harrington shows us how the young man's family and the community are coming together to cope. <laughs> A sea of light took over Butler University's campus earlier this week. The Muslim Student Association and hundreds of supporters gathered at a vigil to honor Abdul Rahman Kasig, a former Butler student who's being held hostage by the Islamic State. I was very surprised to hear that there was a captor from Indianapolis. It really, it caught me off guard. I wasn't expecting it. From a young age, Abdul Rahman's parents say their son felt compelled to help others. Our son was inspired by his grandfather to do humanitarian work. When he saw the suffering of the Syrian people, he went to Turkey and founded an organization to provide aid and assistance. That aid organization is called Special Emergency Response and Assistance, or SARA. Starting in 2012, Abdul Rahman made it his mission to help the Syrian people by delivering food and medical supplies to those fleeing the country's civil war. But that mission was put on hold last October when ISIS captured Abdul Rahman. We know that the Syrians are suffering. We also believe violence is not the solution to the problems that trouble us all. There is so much that is beyond our control. We've asked our government to change its actions, but like our son, we have no more control over the U.S. government than you have over the breaking of dawn. Abdul Rahman was shown at the end of a video released by ISIS last week. After beheading British aid worker Alan Henning, the terrorist organization threatened Abdul Rahman would be next. They've already killed four people. We implore those who are holding you to show mercy and use their power to let you go. Ali Haddad knows just how brutal the terrorist organization can be. He lives and works in Indianapolis, but is from Baghdad. He learned of ISIS for the first time two years ago, the same year he moved to the United States. They didn't have uh, that much of power as, as they have right now, but in the beginning they were like uh, a small group of people, like a branch of Al-Qaeda. Haddad says he's heard stories from family still living there about the unthinkable terror ISIS is inflicting on innocent people. They uh, used to target uh, uh, elementary schools, preschools with uh, suicide bombers and car bombs. So he was horrified, but not surprised when he heard ISIS was beheading journalists and aid workers. Now he's worried about what that will mean for Abdul Rahman. Just pray for him, that's it. We pray that you will give them the strength to endure this test. That's what many across the Hoosier state are doing as they wait to hear any news of Abdul Rahman's well-being. And so we call upon his captors, follow the religion that you claim to hold so dear and have mercy on Abdul Rahman. And be warned, because God also says, he who kills a soul unjustly will be as if he killed all humankind. And as the days pass, Abdul Rahman's parents are asking others to take his mission to heart. They hope his story is raising awareness about the crisis in Syria and encouraging others to help. I think it inspires everybody because the ability for someone to sacrifice so much and put themselves at risk to do these things for other people is something that's great and I think it's something that we again can all learn from and it puts things into perspective. How much can I do for my community? What can I do for my community? Abdul Rahman, he's there to help people. Why on earth would you want to harm someone who's just there to help people? During a vigil today, Paula Kasich read tributes from her son's friends and asked people to pray for her son each day at sunset. 
She is also trying to talk to her son's captors. She reached out to the so-called leader of the Islamic State by posting a letter on Twitter saying, I'm an old woman and Abdul Rahman is my only child. My husband and I are on our own with no help from the government. We would like to talk to you. How can we reach you? Sources close to the family confirm Paula did write the letter. Now that a historic Fisher's house has a new home, local preservation groups are trying to figure out how to use it. The Kincaid Farmhouse took a half-mile journey to its new location at USA Parkway and USA Drive last week. It was going to be demolished to make way for a new commercial development, but the community donated thousands of dollars to help save the home. Well, as you know, Fishers is a relatively new community as far as its population growth. And so it just, I think, warms the heart that everybody here cares so much about its history in addition to its future. Fishers doesn't have many historic homes. This one stood alone out in a community's field for years and years, and it was beloved, and that's why it was saved. And before we say goodbye, we want to say congr congratulations to our education reporting colleagues. They picked up a National Edward R. Murrow Journalism Award this week in New York City for Best Website. It's a competitive competition. There were more entrants this year than ever before. That's stateimpactindiana.org. Con congratulations. And that's the end of this program, but our work continues online as we cover the news in southern Indiana throughout the week at WTIUnews.org. Have a great weekend. Indiana News Desk is made possible in part by the following. Indiana University's Center for Applied Cybersecurity Research, presenting Security Matters with tips for improving online security in three minutes or less. Main Source Bank, headquartered in Greensburg, Indiana, offering products and services to fit every stage of life. More information at mainsourcebank.com. Mainsource, life needs a great bank. Member FDIC and equal housing lender. Smithville Communications, serving Southern Indiana with high-speed fiber gigabit internet. Smithville fiber gigabit technology, tap the power. And by WTIU members, thank you.